disagree, but I think it's probably the biggest choke point for China is the manufacturing side. Um, and I think they understand that. They have currently, I think, 20 plus fabs under construction um, and 50 or 60 operating right now in China. Really, where they struggle is, I guess, on the equipment side. When it comes to anything, I guess, um, in the 20 nanometer or above, um, they're doing okay. Um, and below that, they're kind of struggling. I think from 2015 to 2020, their goal was to be, I think, around 40% self-sufficient, which basically meant uh, that the, the definition of self-sufficient is that it's uh, made in China. So it could be a Samsung fab or a TSMC fab in China, but as long as it's in China, then that counted towards not imported. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then those five years, it's moved from something like 15% made in China to 16%. So way off their 40% target. Um, and so I struggle, I can't see how they can meet uh, the 2025 70% goal. A hundred billion compared to SMIC, I think, is going to be something like four four billion so it, uh, for this year. Um, so it doesn't really compare. Um, and yeah, and as I mentioned, R&D spend as well. You compare uh, TSMC to SMIC. I think TSMC's R&D spend is more or less the same as SMIC's entire revenue um, per year. And it's a moving target, yeah. Um, so if, yeah, we're going to get to... We're going to have seven nanometer you know, capabilities in, in four years' time, let's say. Um, well, everyone else is down to two or something like that. So obviously, there's a big gap to fill when it comes just comes to essentially the EDA tool flow, right? Um, everything from front end to back end that you need to tape out a specific design on. And uh, uh, the big three, or I don't know if it's a big two now, <laughs> but either way, I mean, uh, there's a long way to go before that can be replicated. What they're offering today can be replicated in China. Obviously, I do think it's less of a barrier compared to say the equipment side and the manufacturing side. So the fabs are one aspect, uh, but then you also have semiconductor manufacturing equipments uh, like folks like applied materials, uh, ASML, mm. uh, land research that provide fabs equipment to make these chips. Uh, that's another huge barrier that uh, needs CapEx uh, and uh, R&D investment in that China's got a long way to go on as well, right? Um, I think the EDA tools gap potentially can be filled, but over a long period of time, um, a lot of you can potentially envision folks from Silicon Valley and other areas in the US even returning to China to sort of build up the EDA tools aspect of it, right? So yeah. semiconductor companies have been designing chips in China, multinational semiconductor companies have been in China for a long time designing chips there. Uh, you have fabulous design companies there, like a very silicon, for example, all chip, uh, and so on and so forth. But the tools have to integrate seamlessly all the way through. Then, so as you, as you know, when we were at Cadence, I mean, Cadence w was intimately cooperating. I don't think this is a, a big secret. Intimately cooperating with TSMC, right? Uh, on, on when when a new when a new um, process node was coming out yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, I just say personally, I don't think I've I've met any fabulous company in China ever that doesn't say they're using the synopsis of cadence design flow. Um, I mean, just like I mentioned, um, I, I do anticipate a lot of the X cadence synopsis Silicon Valley folks potentially mm. returning to China. It, almost every day I hear of an X uh, cadence colleague who's setting up his own, uh, you know, EDA. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think these and you have the application engineers, right? Those guys still have all the experience from working with uh, with, with other with cadence or synopsis and that those guys don't forget all that knowledge that they have and even yeah. if it's a different tool set that's where the real value is you have asml in the netherlands right all of these these these, these guys and are, are scattered around the world and you have lots of companies in japan samsung and korea do we is it even possible for i mean i don't think the us could do that right have everybody have its own a completely self-sufficient semiconductor industry if your goal is just to be self-sufficient to a level that means you're protected in some way from being cut off from stuff not necessarily we're self-sufficient in being the best in the world um then i guess it makes sense for a country like china that may feel threatened with uh, again the x cadence folks leaving and and easily starting up their own companies 
Uh, part of that is subsidies that get from the government. Uh, we mentioned, I think Stuart, you mentioned the big fund already, the National Integrated Circuit Industry Investment Fund, which is just a massive, massive fund. It's been around for a, a, more than a few years now, um, putting a lots of money into different parts of the semiconductor industry, but again, a lot into uh, manufacturing. Uh, there are local subsidies around, someone estimated the 300 billion RMB in total kind of subsidies out there. Um, and we know, I'll just throw another stat out there. We know recently it's been um, said that the VC and, and uh, venture capital world has tripled its investment year over year in the semiconductor space. We know the star market uh, recently launched NASDAQ style. You don't have to be profitable to list. Is it actually counterproductive in some ways to throw so much, especially government money into this industry where you're not necessarily, you're distorting you're distorting winners and losers a bit. Yeah, I think it's not necess- it's not really put in the right areas. It's kind of spread it's spread around a lot. Um, it's often local governments that may decide where it goes, and they don't necessarily understand the industry. But I feel like a lot of new VCs in this area um, in China kind of think they're going to get the kind of fast returns they get in in other industries, um, and they don't have an idea of. Um, the amount of upfront cost and and time and patience that they need in the semiconductor industries. There is a dearth of um, experience in the advanced nodes, right? On the design side, I think that's something that China can make up. We talked about it earlier, but mm. um, yeah, I think there's there is a huge leap when you're looking at something like five nanometer, or seven nanometer uh, type fabrication, um, and the talent pool and the experience around that. Um, I think China has a huge leap. Uh, there that they need, to cross, they need to sort of close, right? So. I was talking to an a ex-Cadence uh, colleague who's, who shall not be named, but um, <laughs> last week, and he was telling, he was telling me that he's, he, he's worked with uh, companies in China where, where the engineers are, are 30, 31, 32, and they've done multiple tape outs under their belt. Um, and he's just blown away by that. So, so it's not like there's talent, there's not raw talent and it. Maybe that will catch up fast. Uh, sometimes that talent is maybe spread out too much. I mean, the, the best guys are they're not all in this, let's say 10 companies. We're all, already seeing machine learning being used in various aspects of um, sort of the EDA uh, design flow, right? And optimizations and such. So yes, I do see it creeping into things like verification as well. Um, remains to be seen how fast that happens. Um, but yeah, I think that can potentially close the gap as well. We've danced around it a bit on the, um, uh, but again, the elephant in the room is the, the and, um, this was, uh, it became, it started to become an issue. Um, again, this is all public information when, you know, ZTE was sanctioned for um, the, the sales to Iran and, and, and so forth. Um, and then obviously um, it, 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 uh, there were was rumors that uh, Huawei and High Silicon, High Silicon is Huawei's uh, kind of captive design house, were, were next uh, to, be, to be under the limelight and, um, and, and then obviously people doubted it and it happened. So, um, you know, and then finally um, it was first cut off from buying uh, components, US components in 2019 and last year was cut off from access to TSMC, which was really the big deal. Um, and so what alternatives are there? Because there's um, discussions that other uh, open source uh, options like is it risk five alibaba's made a pretty big uh, investment in risk five yep. uh, high-end risk five design right yeah. so um for the cloud computing chips and such so that's pretty interesting i think there's about actually maybe about a dozen plus companies in china now working on risk five designs including alibaba uh TSM, mm-hmm. uh, sorry alibaba huawei and zt um, right mm-hmm. so i think that's definitely an avenue they're all going to be exploring uh, mm-hmm. On the fabrication yeah. side, potentially, for example, working, building up a team that works with um, a Samsung Foundry is <laughs> an option for high silicon, right? I and feel like the U.S. is going to be coming on, uh, knocking on <laughs> Samsung's door pretty soon. <laughs> but I think recent report from TSMC shows now that high silicon is officially 0% of their revenue. So that means that it's finally worked and high silicon can't do anything at 
TSMC. And by that, I mean, it must also not be able to do anything at Samsung. So it can't do anything in the kind of seven, five, three nanometer space anymore. Um, now on the EDA tool side with them, I, I now then maybe you can say some of this, I don't know, but um, every time I've spoken to them, it's always like, yeah, we, or spoken to Cadence people, it's not as people, yeah, we can't talk to them. Um, there's no support, <laughs> but they have licenses, um, old licenses, which they can kind of still use, but we're not updating what they have. Um, so I, I just, uh, how much, if you're in that situation, how much does that affect the design? I mean, uh, on, from a tools perspective, we're constantly updating tools for Xbox, Y bug, Z bug, and other yeah. aspects around it. And that, that's just a natural pro uh, uh, part of the uh, sort of design flow, right? And um, yeah, that actually is a huge issue, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And natural part of the business model of EDA companies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're doing all these advanced designs and stuff, um, I think you're pretty much dead in the water if you're not if you don't have the support that goes along with it. On the chip side, there's also an architectural issue. So if you look at like sort of, this file might work out for things like uh, mobile and IoT applications, but then yeah. think about applications that require sort of the x86 type processors, right? Mm -hmm. um, like the Intel AMD type stuff. So there's not really an alternative for that either, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then even if, you are, even if you do use RISC-V, you still, have to, and you're doing, you still need to figure out a fab that can tape it out in that advanced node or something. So. Yeah. Okay. A British IP company here um, in, in, who's in the risk five space, maybe like five years ago. And at that time, when I was meeting like, uh, you know, the fabless companies, like nobody has heard of risk five and basically no, no, no one has heard of it. And the people that had heard of it uh, were just referred to it as risk V all the time. Um, that they really realized what it was actually called. They just read something about it. Um, but today, I think basically every fabulous company I meet in China, uh, they're either designing something with RISC V in it uh, or they're considering it, um, mm. or they have actually all gone completely all in on RISC V and that's all they're doing. Um, so everybody's looking at it and a lot are actually doing something with it. And yeah, you mentioned Alibaba, I think. There's a few other risk five core companies like Nucleasis um, and uh, UC Tech. And I think it, yeah, in Taiwan, there's like Andes, um, which is quite, uh, you see quite a lot here in China as well. Um, so there's a lot of companies doing their own cores. Um, and it's, and risk five is really growing here in China. Um, uh, I think it's, yeah, and it's a threat in some way to ARM, especially if ARM definitely gets acquired by NVIDIA. Um, I'm not sure if. <laughs> I don't is think that, that's happening that, anymore. Right? Is, is that <laughs> gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna get into that's the final yeah. topic. We're gonna get into. Oh, is it? Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. If that does happen, then Risk Five is definitely gonna have an even better time in China. But there's like two Risk Five associations in China now, um, and they have I think the first Risk Five China Summit is in uh, June or July this year. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's growing here, and um, yes, yeah, Huawei definitely uh, have a team looking at that as well. Um, won't say more than that. Um, yeah. So okay. I think in, yeah, as we said, like risk five is something that, um, how put it this way, like, so China that has companies like, I think, uh, C-Sky, which was acquired by Alibaba, um, and also like China Core, which have tried to do their own instruction set architectures and be like kind of like the arm of China. Um, and they basically failed at that. Um, there's no way they could globalize. There's no ecosystem. Um, but RISC V has given them a platform. Um, so I think I, I, to answer your question, I think I think I think yeah, I think China can use this. Um, I think maybe Nvidia, maybe it also has some cards it can play because it's it's a huge market in China. A lot of the cloud companies rely on their GPUs, so. Um, I think there's probably some negotiation that NVIDIA can have with the, the government here. Um, but yeah, the market's huge. And, you know, as we saw even this week that, you know, they, they can just block things and, and yeah, I'm sure they can get some concessions um, to let things through. Yeah, there's, well, so that, I mean, that's, that's traditionally, you know, they've been in China for 14 years. I mean, that's, that's uh, traditionally how Things things get changed, right? I mean, no one, no, the, the U.S. government is not going to change its stance on national security 
regulations on m a and, and export control just because china doesn't like it they're going to change it because u.s businesses are lobbying them to not mm. do it right or not implement it to the letter of the law or give a lot of um, licenses ex exemptions and so forth awesome guys hey thanks so much for joining i really appreciate it uh great stuff and i know the audience is going to get a lot out of this one uh, real good deep dive on something that's not covered well except when stewart's quoted in um in the press uh in, in various publications so thanks for coming on guys uh really appreciate it no problem thanks, thanks guys okay. have a good one yeah cheers, cheers. guys cheers